Not many of you may realize that Mickey Mouse actually has a serious contribution to theology. I thought not. <laughs> There's, uh, you remember the old movie Fantasia? Remember that? Yeah, see? I knew I'd get the Whitsylvania side uh, all excited. <laughs> Talking about a little bit about Disney and they're all happy. They're like here. So, anyway, remember the part in there where Mickey is the sorcerer's apprentice? Remember that? And so he is, he is dying to get his fingers on the sorcerer's power, right? So the sorcerer gets tired, he goes to bed. And Mickey goes and takes his hat and stands himself in front of the big book of spells, right? And as, as it's, he's supposed to fill this uh, cistern full of water, and it's a lot of work, he doesn't want to do that. So he, um, he then, he goes to the broom. Remember the broom? The broom is great. In fact, uh, he makes the, the broom grow arms and pick up the buckets and start carrying the, the buckets to the cistern and fill it up. But you remember what happens next? It gets out of hand. He's taking into his hands power he cannot control. It's too big for him. And it runs away from him. And he almost dies. And it's only when somebody bigger comes in and intercedes and makes all the water go back and pulls him out of the water and then Mickey gets to finish filling the cistern. <laughs> Psalm 62.11 says that once the Lord has said, twice I've heard it, power belongs to the Lord. We're going to deal with something that's really huge today. And this is one of those messages where you open your Bible and you begin to look into things and you realize that uh, you're in over your head. There's, there's so much here that we could talk about. So I'm going to try to keep this thing reined in so it doesn't run off with me like Mickey's brooms and buckets. But the issue here we're going to talk about is that power belongs to the Lord. And power should always be held in check by our faith, by what we believe to be true. So I've named this message, Power Corrupts, Faith Preserves. Power corrupts. Faith preserves. You might recognize where that came from, right? Mm -hmm. Lord Acton, you might have heard of him. Famous guy. Um, he died in 1902. He was a member of parliament, and he was known to be one of the most educated men of his day, one of the, the best learned, most uh, amazing guys. Uh, truly an amazing guy to, to sit and read some of his stuff. But that famous quote, we, we shorten it up to power corrupts, right? That's what we hear. However... He said a bit more. It's a little bit longer than that. We, we have abbreviated a bit too much. What he actually said is power tends to corrupt. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. It means it's unavoidable. Great men are almost always bad men, even when they exercise influence but not authority. Still more, still worse, when you super add the tendency of the certainty of corruption by authority. He also said that despotic power is always accompanied by corruption of morality. Power belongs to the Lord. And when we try to take it for ourselves and control it for ourselves, it gets too big for us and it runs away and becomes destructive. In fact, it leads to our own corruption. Mm -hmm. So power is a very dangerous thing. And grab your Bible real quick, if you will. We're going to actually be in Matthew 14, but I want you to see this verse. This is a verse you're kind of familiar with now. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going on to verse 7. We talked about this. This is one of my favorite verses because I, I think it's, I know I said it about every verse, but, but um, I, I mean it this time. This. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, uh, because it's so beautiful, it's so poetic. But this, thing, this, this statement in this verse is just profound. Verse 7, he says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, he's really talking about the life of Christ that's been placed within us. He took Adam's life out and exchanged it for his life and put that life within us, right? That's what being born again is, okay? And so we have this treasure in earthen vessels. He's talking about our flesh. He's talking about our physical bodies. And he's wording it this way just so, so that we understand that we are weak. 
We, we do not have the capacity to contain this treasure. We are a jar with this amazing life within us. But it's not just that, that Jesus has some kind of, of, of life, that he his, his own life that he's put within us. With that life, though, comes who he is. With that life comes a new nature that transforms us. And then life after that becomes a process of him conforming us to match up to the life that is now within us. You with me so far? That's a lot of syllables. You okay with that? All right. Okay. <laughs> but this verse says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? So that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. So this power that God has put within us is supposed to be crediting and serving God's will and God's will alone because it is God's power. It was never ours. Now, if we take this verse alone, we, we begin to think now, where does this expand to? How many things in our life does this touch? Everything. Everything. From the simplest of the simple to the most complex to, to entire nations. This principle touches everything in our lives. Now, turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to see, we're going to see the misuse of power. We're going to see two contrasts. Two <coughs> contrasts. One is a corrupted power and the other is a godly power. And we're going to see how this, how this plays out. It's this principle that power corrupts when it's used for selfish and human purposes, but, but faith preserves that power and preserves the will and the goal intended by God's power as long as we're keeping God in front and center and we're realizing my life is about him and it's not about serving myself. And there are people in the church today that are talking a pretty big game about how God has given you all of this power to do all these amazing things, so you get to have anything and do anything you want. And it's corrupting them. Have you noticed? Power corrupts. Faith preserves. And so if God is going to use power through us, then we must maintain a single focus on what is my life about and what does God want to do through my life? And that and that alone, because that's all that matters. So, Matthew 14, we'll start with verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the news about Jesus. Who is Herod and what is a Tetrarch? I know that that is a burning question that you've been wondering all week long. What on earth is a Tetrarch? And how does one feed it? I mean, how many legs does it have? Uh, I think in this terms it has no legs. It's rather long and reptilian. But that's more political comment than anything else. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the news about Jesus. Now, we want to stop right there. That line controls everything else that's happening. And it'll pick up again in verse 13. And uh, my son-in-law said, is this going to be another two-part that we've come in today? And I said, uh, well, uh, at first I lied. I said, no, well, not really. But yes, it is. <laughs> because this, 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 you know, you're not supposed to lie in church. I thought I should confess before we move farther. But anyway, um, I hope that's as bad as it ever gets. Anyway. <laughs> well, watch the YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, I did, yes. Yeah, it, it'll be on next week, too. So anyway, this leads right into his most famous miracle, which, what you, what would you guess is the most famous miracle? Well, that's close. Feeding the 5,000. Okay. Uh, I guess there's some debate over that. So yeah, no that's because New Creation Church is very biblically literate. And, uh, it's hard to figure that out. So. All right, moving right along. That was really bad. Okay, so who is Herod? Herod. Now this is not the Herod that was that was meeting the wise men when Jesus was born at Christmas. This is his son. His his name is really Herod Antipas. In those days. It was, it was uh, fashionable to name the son, you know, the prince would be named after the father king, okay? They did it with Caesar, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Yeah, you know that Julius Caesar was really his name, but then it was Caesar Augustus, Caesar Tiberius, Caesar blah, 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 right? Okay, until they had so many of them that nobody cared anymore. That's how they ended. Okay, <clears throat> more political commentary. So, so what is a tetrarch? I got a map. 
Okay. Now, this is what modern country? Israel. 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 Okay. Whew, scared me there for a minute. It was a little slow. All right. Now, Herod Antipas was, was Herod a monster? This guy was a, speaking of power corrupting, this guy was a monster. He had a whole slew of wives. He was so suspicious of his power. He was, he was a truly, he was a mass murderer. And he was so suspicious that he began to, to murder his sons, thinking that they were going to overthrow him. And in fact, Herod Antipas was, was coming up to be tried for some kind of treason, which he may well have been involved in, because if your dad is actually bumping your brothers off because he thinks they're going to kill him and take the throne, well, maybe you need to do something to save your neck, right? And so there may have been something, but that's not clear. Anyway, so... So when, when Herod died, and Herod died a little bit after the Herod the Great, okay, that was the dad, such as he was, um, he died a little while after Jesus was born. Remember? You've, you've, I mean, every year we go through this, right? Jesus is born, and then he has to go to what country? Egypt. Egypt. Why? Because if he stays in, in, in Israel, um, Herod's going to find him and kill him, okay? Because he wiped out all the children in Bethlehem. This is an awful, awful person. <clears throat> and he was just getting warmed up. Everybody was afraid of him. He was actually a puppet under the Romans. He wasn't actually a king. But he acted like one. And the Romans stood him up because he was, he was reliable for them. But he was one of the most ruthless people in history. And his son didn't fall too far from that tree. His granddaughter certainly didn't. But anyway, after Herod died... There was some kaflafel over, uh, it's a technical theological term, mm -hmm. over who was going to inherit his, his power. So there was a power vacuum, and there was some scrambling. And some other sons, Philip being one of them, we'll talk about him in a second, and, and Herod himself, Herod Antipas himself, were a part of that vacuum. So what happened was, the Romans carved this up into a set of of four administrative districts, and they set a very powerful person up over each one. So each one of those administrators was called a tetrarch. Four tetrarch, with me, right? You knew that, didn't you? Some, yeah, okay. All right, <clears throat> anyway. So, Herod Antipas controlled this area here, the pink ones, okay? Now, this area here was Nabatea. It was an Arabic kingdom, uh, largely of, of nomads, but they've gotten quite powerful. Uh, very rich on some of the trade stuff that was going on. And Herod Antipas married the daughter of the king of Nabatea. With me so far? It's just going to get complicated, okay? So hang on. Because this is so incestuous and so twisted. Okay? So... At that, back to verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the news about Jesus. And so after Augustus died, and there was this, this shuffle of power, Caesar Tiberius came to power, and he was the one that had to figure out what was going on because Herod had died also. So he appointed, um, he appointed which was actually the will of, of Augustus, he appointed Herod, Herod Antipas, in this position of a Tetrarch. He also set up his half-brother, who was the son of Herod the Great, by another woman. Yeah, it gets ugly. So he set him up as another tetrarch. And there was a couple others. We don't need to go into that today. Anyway, so he ruled, Antipas ruled for 42 years in that, that tetrarchy. Now, verse 2. We're actually getting verse 2. And he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now notice then, if he's hearing about Jesus, this will come up next week in part two, but he's hearing about Jesus at this point. He's hearing about Jesus, and John the Baptist is already dead. Don't miss that. Okay. But why is Herod thinking Jesus was John the Baptist? He had a guilty conscience. Verse 3. For when Herod, had, when Herod had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison because of who? Herodias. Herodias. Now this is tricky. This is tricky because we think that Herod Antipas is really the bad guy here, and he is. He is a bad guy. He's a very bad guy. 
but it's Herodias, the one that's behind him. Mm -hmm. This is the real cunning in this couple. Anyway, and she's the wife of his half-brother, Philip, one of the other tetrarchs. Now, Antipas, I told you it's going to get complicated, so if you, if you get anything out of this section, I'm going to try to explain this to you. If you get anything out of this, just think these are icky people. Okay? If you get that, it's theologically correct, you're good to go. These are icky people. Okay? And they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. All right. So Philip was his half-brother, okay? Herod Antipas' half-brother. They had made a trip to Rome for who knows what reason, uh, a few years, some years before this, and Antipas had met Philip's wife, Herodias. Herodias was the granddaughter of both of their father, Herod the Great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, quite the gal. <laughs> anyway, so they had met. They started an affair in Rome, and Herod Antipas agreed that he would divorce his, his first wife, the daughter of the king of Nabatea, and then marry Herodias, and he could gain more power this way. I think, I think there was genuinely uh, an affair going on there. I don't think it was just all over politics. So anyway, so uh, Herodias leaves Philip, goes to, to Antipas. Antipas's first wife sneaks away. She hears this is coming. She sneaks away, goes to a fortress, which is also a prison, and that's the same place that John the Baptist was beheaded. Anyway, she goes there. Her dad comes out of Nabatea. That's right. No, no, that's fine. Her dad comes out of Nabatea, rescues her from this fortress, and takes her back to, to Arabia and declares war on Herod Antipas. Of course he did. He was a little ticked off. Can you imagine? And so, because that really would be an act of war. And so he declares war. Now, in the power shuffle, Herod Antipas pleads to Rome, to Tiberius, for help. So Tiberius orders one of his generals uh, to go and save him. Now, about that time, also, though, Tiberius died. And so the Roman general, who didn't seem to really, see his name was Valenius or something like that, he didn't seem to like Herod Antipas too much. And so after Tiberius died, he just decided, oh, you know, I don't think I have authority to wage this war. So he withdrew. This created, as you might imagine, some bad blood between Herod Antipas and the Roman government. Now we're getting to the point here where this is, this is well into Jesus' ministry. All this was going on in the background behind Jesus' life. Okay? And so Herod Antipas had his clock cleaned, that's a military term, from, by, the, by the Nabataeans, just destroyed him. And they, they sacked his cities and, and routed his armies, and he was really weakened over this. So he was pretty hacked off at the Romans. And one little interesting thing, remember that, that, that scene when Jesus is being, I know this is looking way ahead, but when Jesus was tried in front of Pilate, he finds out mm -hmm. that Jesus is a Galilean. Mm -hmm. And so he was therefore under the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. And he sends him to be tried under the, 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 the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. And it says at that time they became friends. How did that happen? They hadn't been friends before. They cut a deal. I don't know what that deal was, but they cut a deal. Maybe Pilate said, I, I will help you this time. I don't know. We really don't know. But these are politicians, and these are icky people. There's that theological term. And so they're, they're using and abusing power constantly. Aren't you glad we have a constitution? <laughs> Praise God for that. Because this is the kind of stuff that takes place when there is no restraint on power. Mm -hmm. So anyway, long story short, um, Herod Antipas had, had an affair with his half-brother's wife, who was also his sort of niece. <sighs> and so because of all that, it says... For when Herod had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. I think, I think Herod was put up to arrest him by Herodias. Verse 4. 
For John had been saying to him, to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have her, although Herod wanted to put him to death. He feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. So by the way, governments governed at the consent of the governed even then. Just thought I'd throw that in for me. He fears the crowd. But he wants, he, wants to, he wants to execute him, but he's afraid of the crowd because they regarded John, John the Baptist to be a prophet. So he puts him in prison to shut him up, get him off the street. But he doesn't quite have the backbone to do the whole job. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced. Now, now figure out the family lines here. Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. He married Herod the Great's granddaughter through another woman. Her daughter is this dancer. How is, he, how is she related to Herod Antipas? I will let you figure that out, okay? I don't know if that's a niece or a cousin or what that is, but whatever it is, this shouldn't have been going on. Because what happens then is, but when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Now Josephus, Josephus records for, for us her name. Her name was Salome. Mm -hmm. Ever heard that name? Mm -hmm. What comes to mind when you hear that name Salome? A nice girl, seduction. A nice girl that you want your son to bring home? <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. And apparently this is a, a correct representation of what she was. But she, she dances for Herod so much that he, that he was pleased. He, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. This just gets weirder and more sordid every moment. Mm -hmm. Now, we need to think, though, at first, at first blush, isn't that like, what a ridiculous thing to promise? Why would you do that? Now, we're thinking from a Western standpoint. We think at least through the, the, the lens of a Roman tradition, and, and probably more likely as we would view through a maybe a British monarch. You know, that's the closest thing we get. And, and, but even so, we still think of, you can't just throw your power all over the place because we think in terms of limited, limited government, and they don't. They don't have that. And in those days, a, a potentate, you know, a, a king or a ruler was supposed to be wealthy and powerful, and this, had, this was like the hallmark of, of the kind of influence and strength that they had. And if they didn't have that kind of wealth and, and opulence, then they weren't considered very important. So the way they showed that off was they would make these grandiose, spectacular kinds of gifts. And it showed how, how magnificent they are. So we have to see this through, through Eastern eyes. So he makes this promise. And then Herodias sees her moment. Hadn't been prompted by her mother. Do you see there? So all of that treachery and deceit and viciousness, that vindictiveness, the suspicion, almost probably paranoia that was seething through Herod the Great's veins, now we see it surface again in his granddaughter. Having been prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. And although he was grieved, the king commanded it to be given because of his oaths and because of his, his dinner guests. His power now had been, had been manipulated around him because he's wielding power for his own purposes. And he can't control it. We see it right here. There are other times, too. He decides to have an affair and, and divorce his wife and, and all of that. He ends up in a war, and he can't control this power, and the Romans aren't going to help him with it. He made this mistake. That's your bed. You lie in it. We'll pick up the pieces because we're in control anyway, and we'll, we'll, we'll strengthen whoever we want in this situation. So it's already gotten away from him, seriously, at least once. But here it happens again. And so his wife and relative. I mean, this, this must have been southern Syria or something. I don't, I don't know what this is. She takes advantage of this. And although he was grieved, the king commanded to be given because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests. So he's in this double bind. He has behaved as an eastern king, as an eastern potentate, by making this grandiose gesture to show how 
opulent he is, how powerful he is, how wealthy he is. But he gets twisted around and turned against him. And now he's forced into the very thing he's been trying to avoid. And this, this woman that he seems to love has now <coughs> manipulated him into a corner to do something he doesn't want to do. And power just kind of leaks out of his hands and goes into the hands of other people that he cannot control. But they can control him. They th he thinks he has power, but he doesn't. He's using power that doesn't belong to him. And he's corrupt enough that his, I mean, he's already kissing up to this, this daughter of his wife. I mean, that's weird as it is. But now it's turned around to bite him. So he sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. What a horrifying experience for her. She couldn't have been that old. And she brought it to her mother. His disciples came and took away the body and buried it, I assume without the head. And they went and reported to Jesus. So they told him what happened. Now all of this happened before Herod heard about Jesus and guessing that Jesus was the miracle worker, so he must be John risen from the dead. So they buried him. And I would imagine over the years, John was eulogized. John the Baptist has been eulogized over and over and over. Every time the Gospels gets preached through and you know, we talk about John the Baptist and what an amazing man he was, and truly, truly, truly he was. And I started making a list of things that I won't go through, so just rest easy. But I came up with probably 12 or 15 things that I could have listed about John the Baptist and what an amazing man he was. Truly, he was an amazing man. And Jesus said that there was no greater man born of woman than John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he said, you know, that, you know, he says... Because Elijah was the one who was prophesied that he would come and pave the way for the Messiah. And he says, John the Baptist was Elijah. Now how it works out, I'm not exactly sure. Was it, you know, personally Elijah or in the role of Elijah? I'm not exactly sure. So I'm just going to leave that in intention for now. And, and you theologians out there can figure that one out. But in any case, he was doing exactly what Elijah was supposed to have done, and that was proclaim the Messiah. And there's no greater man born of woman than John the Baptist. And John was not afraid for his life. Proverbs 28 says that the, the wicked run away when there's nothing to run away from. But the righteous are bold as a lion. John the, John the Baptist wasn't afraid of anything. I think we would probably be a little bit afraid of John the Baptist just because here's a guy that is so bold and so clear on the vision of his life and so directed in what he's going to do. To us sometimes, in our, in our comfort, in our churchianity, I think sometimes he would have come across to us like a loose cannon. But this guy was an amazing guy. He was the herald for the Messiah. He's the one that would preach and thunder at the people. And he'd preach and thunder the people, and he would say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he would say that the one follows after me, who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. Now, we, we have often misunderstood what that message is. He's saying, I, he, what he's really saying is, the one who comes after me, you think I'm baptizing water? I'm just baptizing water. That's all I'm doing here. I'm trying to get you guys to wake up and repent and get your act together with God, because you're far away from God. This is why John the Baptist was baptizing outside of Jerusalem. Have you noticed that? He baptized in what river? Jordan. The Jordan. Now, wasn't there some cistern or some puddle or some something somewhere else around there? There were a lot of people living there. There had to be bodies of water stored someplace. There were creeks and brooks and all of that across. Why the Jordan? What made me answer that, ask that question in the first place was this wasn't the first baptism we've seen in the Jordan, was it? Do you remember Naaman the leper? Remember him? So he crosses the, the Jordan with this wagon full of money and he goes looking for Elisha. 
because he's sick. He's a leper. He needs some help. And, and he's been counseled. Just go see this prophet in, in Israel. He will help you. And so he just loads up a wagon full of money. That's a lot of money. That's better than probably any lottery ticket you've ever seen. And so he rolls up to where Elisha is living. And Elisha won't even come out of the house. He won't even talk to him. He sends a servant. Servant, go see him. And uh, <clears throat> my master says, uh, I mean, what an awkward moment. <laughs> Here's this guy. He's a right-hand general to the most powerful military power in the area at the time. Probably a very skilled guy. And he's coming there with his hat in his hand and a, and a pile of money to, to buy a miracle. Hoping to get well to buy his life. And Elisha says to his servant, uh, go talk to this guy. Here's what I want. So he goes to him and says, uh, uh, I mean, this is the day version, but um, uh, I see that really sharp, shiny sword there, but uh, my master says he's um, not going to come out, that you're supposed to go wash in the Jordan seven times. And excuse me, I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> And Naaman's standing there with his entourage and a wagon full of money. And the next thing he hears is the door click. And the DLT inserts, what was that? <laughs> they want me to go wash in the Jordan, that murky, muddy, trucky river-sized thing. And there's way better rivers where I'm from. And so he's, he's getting mad. And he's got, he has a good friend. Smart friend. The guy's not even a believer, but he's a smart friend. Look, 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 look. If, if he had asked you to go find, it wasn't there yet, but the Holy Grail, would you have gone to go do that? Go kill a dragon? Wouldn't you have gone to go do that? All he's asking is walking the, watching the Jordan. Why the Jordan? Well, who was baptized in the Jordan before that? The Jordan was parted, remember? For Israel to go through and into the promised land. If you're going to come to me, God is saying, you'll come to me on my terms. I will help you, not on your terms. Not for a wagon full of money. I have all the gold I need. And I wouldn't ask you for it. John baptizes him in the Jordan. Because if they're going to come to God, they're going to come to God on his terms as if they're entering the promised land all over again. Mm -hmm. You with me? Mm -hmm. Leave everything from Egypt behind, everything from Syria behind, leave your stupid wagon full of money behind. I don't care about that. You come to me on my terms and my terms alone. Here is God exercising his power. And so he's baptizing in the Jordan. And John cries out when he sees Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Mine. Yours. He's been shouting the whole time, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming. I told you, I told you, I told you. And there he is. And that moment is here. And here's the man who has been able to command large crowds of people, even people who are hostile to him, they come and they pretend obedience to him. This is a powerful, powerful man. But he knows none of that power is his own. Because he says, I must decrease. He must increase. And so the power he's wielding has nothing to do with John's possession of it. It is not his power, and he knows it. And so his whole life is merely about being a conduit for God's power to go through him into the mission that God has in mind. There is nothing else of importance to John. And John, John as you know, was, shall we say, an unconventional man. He seemed to prefer natural fibers. <laughs> He, he clothed himself with camel hair. Uh, nowadays, you know, we, we spent a lot of money for camel hair, but in those days it wasn't really valued all that much. But uh, 
He was truly a creature of God, and he had to live by faith, even for his daily food. I mean, a guy that lives on bugs, a guy that lives on, on, on locust, you know, I'll bet, I'll bet those babies are hard to catch. Anyway, but a guy that lives on that has got to be trusting God for his every meal, right? You know, our daily bread, or, or our daily bug. And so, <coughs> because he lived like that, and he was unentangled then from anybody else. His whole life then, he was, not, he was not beholden to anybody. He was not in obligation to anybody. And if you look at Matthew 11, just go a couple pages back to Matthew 11. There was a scene where uh, the disciples of, of Jesus, or disciples of John, had come to see Jesus. And they were, they were concerned about whether this was really the Messiah or not. Because John is in prison. He's getting a little confused. I mean, he's still he's still walking with God, but he's you know, did I prepare my way for you? Or are you really the Messiah? Because I don't really see you do what I expect you to do. Even he had a few bent ideas here. But as those men were, were going away, Jesus began to speak. I'm sorry, Matthew 11 verse 7. Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Some plant out there shaking in the wind? Is that is that just just a curiosity? Just to watch it buzz in a breeze. But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. And they're also on a leash. But what did you go out to see? It's the third time. A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesies until John. And if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And a lot of people will stand around there just didn't quite get it. So he didn't belong to anybody. So he could, he could, he could move with unhindered freedom and purpose. He could be as premeditated as he needed to be to use God's power in the way that God had called him to. How was he able to do that? And the power did not consume him or corrupt him. Because it sure didn't. Because he always knew who he believed. He always knew what he believed in. He never questioned it. Are you with me on that? Faith preserves. Power. He always trusted in God. And he knew very well that power belongs to God. This, this treasure we have in earth and vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. And he goes on to talk about the things that we suffer and the things that we struggle in this Christian life. And, and he says, and why is that? So that the life of Christ may be manifested in our mortal flesh. This is what it's all about. This is what it's always ever been about. This isn't about miracles and, and, and gee whiz and wealth and health and all this stuff, that the baloney that's out there. It's about that simple, clear, undeniable manifestation of something supernatural from heaven in you that nobody else can explain. That is power. But we cannot wield that power. God does that through us. And so then... It has to be used for God's will, or it will ruin the user. Faith in Christ, then, is the firewall between being a conduit of God's gracious power on earth among men and becoming a loose cannon. Do you know the image of loose cannon? Do you know where that comes from? It's an old naval thing. Yeah, I mean, Whistlebane knows. But it's an old, it's an old naval thing. And, you know, in sailing ships, you know, they're crashing over the waves. They weren't quite as stable as our, our, our modern, like, aircraft carriers. Um, but a cannon in those days was a big hunk of iron on, on, a, on a cart, right? 
And if it got loose, as the ship would pitch and roll, that cannon, which could weigh several tons, would be smashing from one side of the ship to the other. How do you get that stopped and tied off? Think of the damage. A loose cannon can sink the ship. We don't want to become a loose cannon. We watched this Luther film on, on Wednesday. And one of the things that Luther talked about was the word of God is the only authority. And he didn't recognize any other authority. Not the authority of priests or preachers. How many Christians build their life around the preacher they hear on the internet? Have they cracked their Bible and really read it? Dr. Mitchell used to say, you know, that the, the, the theme for Multnomah School of the Bible was, if it's Bible you want, you want Multnomah. At the time, it was probably the best Bible college in the world. It was an amazing place. And so, um, he would say, if it's Bible you want, stay home and read it. <laughs> yeah. Read the thing. Don't... don't depend on what somebody else is telling you. Go to the source. And so what, what Luther was standing up for, because he was actually doing this, that the word of God is the authority, that's what our faith is in, and there is power in the word of God, and if we are going to wield it, then we need to believe the author of those scriptures. And what he said is true and reliable. It's honorable. It is correct. It is holy. It is undeniable. And so we do not trust priests or preachers or councils or denominations or popes. We preach Christ Jesus and him crucified because it is predicted in the scriptures and recorded in the scriptures and he's coming again because this is what the scriptures have told us and the scriptures are reliable and can be verifiable. And this then is how power in even the everyday mundane things of your life that is kept from becoming something that sweeps you away into corruption. By, so what do we do with all this? By faith, people must use the power of God in the Lord's will, doing the Lord's will in the lives of others. This is a difficult challenge. If we don't see, what is God trying to do in the life of this person in front of me? That's the question we have to ask. What is God doing in this person's life? We're not asking, what is God going to do in me through him? What do I get from this? We're asking, what is God doing in that guy's life? Go do that. Go do that. Because that's God's will. And he will then be able to use power through you to accomplish his will in that person's life. And that person will then turn to Jesus. They may not even know that you talk to them. It's not about you. He must increase. I must decrease. People must use the, the, the Lord's power for his will in the lives of others, or they, they have hijacked what belongs to God. And they will simply be unable to control it. And in the end, they'll be shipwrecked. So all of this has to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Where does that lead us? Know your Bible and pray. Pray. Have you noticed the world is kind of deceitful and it's hard to tell? Or is it just me? Hi, I'm Dave and I'm a Christian and I'm kind of confused. Hi, Dave. Okay. By faith. You know, there's this line in Matthew 5.5, 5, Blessed are the meek, right? We, we, we struggle with that one. Blessed are the meek. It can also be translated gentle. It can be translated submissive. Blessed are the meek. It's the ones who submit themselves to the will of God. And what do they inherit? The earth. Because God then can use his power through them to govern the lives of his creation. And it doesn't become a runaway train. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. By faith, husbands slash fathers should not lord their power over their homes. I'm a therapist, and I can't tell you how many men I've talked to. I'm the man of the house, and what says what I say here goes. And because I'm the husband, because I'm the, the father, you, you have to submit to me. 
Can you hear the runaway train whistle already blowing? Is sure bloviating through his mouth. That is a train wreck waiting to happen. And he's going to end up with kids who are crushed and hide from him or kids who will rebel from him. Because he will absolutely exasperate those poor children and his poor wife. Don't get me started. <laughs> because he's misusing that power. He's not looking at the reason God has given me this power and this authority in the home is to disciple my children. That's what discipline's root word is. Disciple. You can't get your kid to brush his teeth. Then you get your toothbrush and you go brush your teeth with him. That's the stuff that Jesus would do. You can't get him to clean his room. Go clean the room with him. Get in there clean your wrist, you told. How's that working for you? Go do it with him. Disciple him. Make that an attachment moment. You know the most fundamental human drive in the survival is to be attached to the most you think relationship. You haven't heard that in a while, but it's still true. And so when we turn those kinds of tasks into an attachment event where the kid is, it knows it and the, and the wife knows that they are loved in that moment, that becomes the emotional uh, thread, the emotional saturation perhaps of those events that maybe they don't really want to go do. But I was loved there. Now I can go do it. You with me on this? So we have to use power in a way that it is in keeping with God's will. What is God's intention in my children? What is God's intention in my wife? What is God's intention in my son-in-law? Matthew 13, 52, it talks about a scribe. Remember a scribe? We talked about what that was. We don't have time to go into that. But a scribe who has been discipled by the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings from his treasure. You remember the Eastern potentate idea? Who brings from his treasure all of these gifts to supply for these people. God is working through this guy to supply treasures and power and resources to pour into the lives of these people that he loves, that he's responsible for. It's not about him. It's not about him. And then that power does not become a runaway train. It doesn't become a, a, a loose cannon. It doesn't corrupt. It stays sensitive. It stays loving. It stays aware. It stays wise. Churches and elders, we've talked often that we must consider as a church, as leaders in this church, what power is and how to handle it. And everything in this church will be, as long as I'm drawing a breath, will be about making disciples. And, and Lyle agrees, so don't even ask him about it. He's on the same page with me. And our wives, by the way. Ha, 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 ha. Everything that we will do is all about fulfilling the Great Commission because that's what a church exists for. It is to make disciples. It is not about butts in chairs writing checks and building bigger buildings. If God leads us in that direction, then fine. It's not about smoke machines. Yes, I said that. And I'll say it again. Another time. But churches have to be directed at making disciples to teach people the scriptures, to teach them how to pray, to facilitate, dare I say, be accessories to, to crimes with humanity of potlucks. <laughs> and we got a big one planned next weekend. So, show up or go hungry, because we're going to solve a little corner of world hunger right here that morning, okay? <laughs> we're going to celebrate what God has given to us because he is so kind and generous to us. <clears throat> Everything in a church has to be directed to making disciples one way or another. Are we are always sure about, is this, what we, is this discipling, is that discipling? Sometimes it's hard to tell because life is messy. So pray about this that God will direct the use of his power to this congregation in making disciples. And some of that's going to be missions. We talked some about, about people that are hurting out there. Do you think God cares about them suffering? Of course he does. I don't know what we can do exactly, but we're going to do something. Because that's God's will, and he's given us power to do it, so we're going to do it. 
governments. I'm going to try not to get into politics, as fun as that might be. But if faith is what restrains the corrupting influence of power and keeps it directed in constructive directions, then political power, governmental power, they're really different things, aren't they? Governmental power must be directed in a way toward God's will in the world. I'm not preaching theocracy. But it has to be built around the preciousness and indisputable infinite value of every human soul. What is best for them? What is best for their building up, for their prosperity, for their care? And so I believe that a populist system, short of having another David to sit on a throne, I believe that populism, which is government of the people, by the people, for the people, fulfills this, this understanding of power in the world best. Did you see Virginia? <laughs> but populist rule is consistent with this picture, with this principle. One last illustration. David helped Israel. He was a king. David helped Israel prosper financially. There was so much gold that silver was no longer valuable. Think about that. And he and he was collecting all those resources to build the temple. David was a man after God's own heart. He had problems. He had some terrible uh, failures. But, and the funny thing is, when it was all over, God never brought it up again. Mm -hmm. Never, never. Anyway, Solomon, who inherited that, remember Solomon? <coughs> he lost sight of it. Mm -hmm. And he started seeking, this is really curious, in Ecclesiastes, there's something very sad that runs through Ecclesiastes besides vanity, vanity. It's <laughs> why is he saying this? What brought him to this place? Because what he's trying to do is he's trying to figure out the meaning of life. <gasps> he's lost sight of God. And so he explored all these things, wealth and political power and all this other stuff that he tried to, and building and achievement and learning and women and money and all of this. He, he, he explored all those things and he found it was empty. And in the meantime, he's trying to create political advantage, and he's marrying all these women from other kingdoms, and he started serving their gods to keep them happy. He is the one that reintroduced Canaanite religion into Israel after David. And it ended up right after him with, with vicious confiscatory taxes, and it split the kingdom into two. It became a runaway train because he was using power for his own use, and he couldn't control it. Faith. Faith. What is God doing in my life? Faith restrains. It refines. It confines. It directs. It controls. It has a throttle. Power corrupts. It's not yours. We have this treasure in earth and vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from us. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you've taught us the righteous shall live by faith. And in that faith, you give us power and resources to do your will, and your will only, not ours. So Lord, may that echo in our hearts every single day, from moving our hands to loving our wives, to discipling our kids, to working for employers, or to handling our employees. Or if you should will, that we would reach thousands for Christ. Whatever it is that you choose to do, we are in your hands and we trust you to do it well. It is not our power and we cannot control it. Teach us to abandon that idea and just to embrace you. In Jesus' precious name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.